The government is too powerful. One way to limit their power is through the Bill of Rights, sometimes called as the Declaration of Rights or the Charter of Rights. It is the least of the most important rights to the citizens of a country. Here is a fan fact. Did you know that the Bill of Rights serves as our protection against the violations from the government and any individual? That is why it's important for us to study the third article of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, also known as the Bill of Rights. In this video, we will talk about all the rights stated in the Bill of Rights. Let's start with the right to due process. Article 3, Section 1 states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor shall any person be denied of the equal protection of the laws. There are three rights mentioned under this section. First, the right to life. This means that nobody, including the government, can try to end your life. This also talks about the quality of life. Second, the right to liberty or the right to be free. Third, the right to property. This means that you have the right to own anything without any threat being faced. These three rights cannot be taken away from you without due process. So what is due process? Due process is the requirement that legal matters must be resolved according to established rules and principles. For example, under due process, individuals cannot have their property seized or they cannot be put in jail without first going through the legal system to determine if they are guilty of the crime. Also included in this section is the equal protection of laws. This means that the government must treat similarly situated individuals in the same manner. This protection covers all citizens, including the aliens of a country. For example, everyone earning an income is taxed. The tax rates are based on the same standards for persons that are similarly situated. Let's move on to the second right, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures. First, let's differentiate search from seizure. Search is a process conducted by authorized officers to look for specific items that are related to the crime. Seizure, on the other hand, happens if officers take possessions of the items during the search. Take note of this. A search and seizure is considered unreasonable if it is conducted by police officers without a valid search warrant and warrant of arrest. Let's define these two documents. Warrant of arrest is an official document signed by the judge which authorizes police officers to arrest a person or people named in the document. Search warrant refers to an official document signed by the judge which authorizes police officers to search a particular location and seize specific items. A valid search warrant and warrant of arrest must contain the following. First, it must be issued upon probable cause or sufficient reason based upon known facts to believe a crime has been broken or that certain property is connected with a crime. For example, police officers cannot arrest someone who looks like a criminal. Just because someone wears a black shirt with a black mask doesn't mean that person is a criminal. There is a high possibility that he's attending a cosplay or a party. Again, probable cause is a must. Second, probable cause must be determined personally by the judge. Third, the judge must examine the complainant and the witnesses he may produce under oath or affirmation. Last, the warrant must particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Another important term to remember is the warrantless arrest. There are times when a police officer doesn't need a warrant of arrest. This is what we call warrantless arrest or an arrest without a warrant. This is valid in the following cases. First, in flagrante delicto. 
the person to be arrested has committed, is committing, or is attempting to commit an offense. Second, the hot pursuit arrest. The policeman should have a personal knowledge that the suspect committed a crime. Last, a prisoner who escaped from prison. It is also important to take note that police officers are not the only ones who can arrest a person committing a crime. Normal people like you and me can also arrest someone. This is what we call citizen's arrest, a lawful warrantless arrest performed by a civilian. However, this is not recommended because it might be dangerous. The best thing to do is report the crime to the police instead of acting on your own. Similar to warrantless arrest is a warrantless search or a search without a warrant. Police officers can only search without a warrant in the following situations. First, if there is a consent. An individual must freely and voluntarily agree to a search of his or her property. For example, police officers went to your house and asked permission to search your garage because your neighbors heard a gunshot and called the police. If you say yes, they can lawfully search in the garage but not in the other areas of your house. Second, exigent circumstances. If the police officers feel that the time that it would take to get a warrant would jeopardize public safety or lead to the loss of evidence, they can perform a search without a warrant. For example, Popoy is a suspected drug dealer in Barangay Manalala. One night, police officers passed by his house and heard the suspect say, The police are coming! Throw away all the evidences! The police officers can search his house even without a warrant because they might destroy the evidence. Third, search incident to an arrest. A police officer doesn't need a warrant to perform a search in connection with an arrest. For example, if you are arrested for drug possession, the police can search for additional drugs by searching you, your home, or your car. And any evidence found can be used against you in a court of law. Last, the plain view doctrine. Police officers to legally search an area if the evidence is clearly visible. For example, if a police officer stops a driver for speeding and sees marijuana in the window, a search can be conducted without a warrant. Now let's move on to the right to privacy. This refers to the right of a person to be left alone. The right to privacy is not violated when first, there is a lawful order of the court. For example, there is a search warrant. Second, when public safety or order requires it. For example, a policeman enters a house because someone is shouting for help. This is not a violation of the right to privacy. Moving on to the next right, the freedom of speech and of expression and of the press. This is the right to express any opinion without censorship or restraint. This includes the right to express your views aloud through the following. Published articles and books, television or radio broadcasting, works of art, the internet, and the social media. Now there is a limitation to this right. It ends when you start to violate the rights of another person or the values of the society as a whole. For example, defamation. Defamation is saying or writing something about another person that hurts their reputation. There are two kinds of defamation, libel and slander. If the statement is made in writing and published, the defamation is called libel. If the hurtful statement is spoken, the defamation is slander. You can be sued if you commit any one of these. Let's move on to the freedom of assembly. This refers to the right to hold a rally or to voice out grievances against the government. There are some situations in which public authorities can restrict your rights to freedom of assembly in order to first, protect national security or public safety. Second, protect the rights and freedoms of other people. And last, to prevent disorder or crime. 
Another right is the freedom of religion. It is the right of an individual to worship God without interference from any person or power. There are two aspects of freedom of religion. First, the freedom to believe in any religion. Second, the freedom to act in accordance with such belief. This is not an absolute right. This is subject to rules and laws of the state. For example, no one can appear nude in public in the name of religion. The Bill of Rights also included the prohibition of religious tests. Religious tests is one that is requiring someone to have a religious belief before the performance of the act. This is considered as a violation of the freedom of religion. For example, candidates running for president should be Roman Catholic only. Now let's talk about the liberty of abode and the right to travel. Liberty of abode is the right of a person to choose and change his residence without interference from the government. The right to travel is the right to go to different places. These rights may be denied or restricted by the state if first there is a lawful order of the court. For example, Pedro is facing criminal charges and he wants to go abroad. He may be restrained by the court from leaving the country or if he is already abroad, he will be compelled to return. Second, national security, public safety, or public health is in danger. For example, last March 2020, the Philippine government banned all the travels from China, South Korea, Hong Kong, and other nearby countries to stop the spread of COVID-19. Moving on to the next slide. The right of the people to information. In a democratic state, the citizens have the right to access the records of their government. This is to prevent public officials from engaging in corrupt practices. The following documents can be disclosed to the public. First, official records. Second, documents and papers pertaining to official acts, transactions, or decisions. And last, government research data used as a basis for policy development. There are also some documents which should not be disclosed to the public. These are the following. First, records involving the security of the state. Second, accounts pertaining to military intelligence plans. Third, trade secrets and banking transactions. Fourth, identity of informants in criminal investigation. And last, Confidential Diplomatic Matters Next, the right to form associations. This is the freedom to organize or to be a member of any group, association, union, or society. This right may be exercised by the employed, both in the public and the private sectors, and also the unemployed. Moving on to right to just compensation. To understand this right, let's talk about the inherent powers of the state. These are the powers that the Congress and the President need in order to get the job done right. First, the police power. Second, the power of taxation. And last, the power of eminent domain. First, police power. This is the power to enact regulations for the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Second, power of taxation. This is the power of the government to impose and collect taxes. Last, the power of eminent domain. This is the power of the government to take a private property. Eminent domain is valid in the following cases. First, it must be a private property. Second, the land confiscated is for public use. Third, there must be a due process of law and expropriation. And last, there is a just compensation. This means that owners will be paid accordingly when their property gets seized by the government for public. Now let's talk about the obligation of contracts. Obligation of contracts is the legal duty of the contractor to fulfill the promise stated in the contract. For example, in a contract of sale, the obligation of the buyer is to pay the price agreed upon, 
while the obligation of the seller is to deliver the thing sold. Take note that the government cannot pass a law that would stop a contract from being enforced. The purpose of non-impairment prohibition is to assure the fulfillment of promises between parties and to avoid problems. Next, the writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is the Latin phrase which means you may have the body. This is because the person who's keeping you in jail literally has to bring your body to the courthouse. Habeas corpus means that you have the right to make the government prove to a judge that your arrest and detainment are justified. If you feel that you were wrongfully imprisoned, you can file a writ of habeas corpus which is an official request to have your day in court. The purpose of writ of habeas corpus is to control the police and other governmental entities and make sure that they don't abuse their power. However, the following are some instances where the privilege of writ of habeas corpus is suspended. First, in cases of invasion or rebellion. Second, when public safety requires it. Moving on to debt and poll tax. Article 3, Section 20 states that no person will be sent to jail because of failure to pay a debt and poll tax. However, there are limitations. First, creditors can still bring you to the court to demand and enforce payment of your debt. Second, if the person is guilty of estafa or the crime of obtaining money dishonestly or by trickery, he will be sent to jail. For example, David paid his debt in a bank through a check. The bank found out that the check that he gave doesn't have enough money. The check is called a bounce check. The bank can now sue him for his staff. Next, Ex Post Facto Law and Bill of Attainder. Article 3, Section 22 states that no Ex Post Facto Law or Bill of Attainder shall be enacted. Ex Post Facto Law is a law that applies to crimes that happened before the law was passed. For example, let's say that in December 2019, you accidentally smoke in a public area. Last month, a law was signed prohibiting smoking in public areas. Today, the cops are at your door to arrest you for the incident. The new law would be an example of ex post facto law as it wasn't illegal to smoke when you did it. When does ex post facto law apply? First, if it makes the person a criminal because of an act that was not a crime when committed. Second, it aggravates a crime or makes it greater when it was committed. Third, it changes the punishment of a crime and inflicts greater punishment. Fourth, it decreases the amount of evidence required for a conviction. It is also important to remember that ex post facto law is applicable only in criminal cases. Moving on to the Bill of Attainder. The Bill of Attainder is a legislative act that imposes punishment without a trial. Now let's talk about the rights of an accused under custodial investigation. Custodial investigation is any questioning initiated by law enforcement officers after a person has been taken into custody. First, the Miranda rights. You probably heard the police on TV say something like, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. This statement is called Miranda warning. It is a constitutional requirement that once an individual is detained by the police, there are certain warnings. A police officer is required to give to a detainee. The Miranda warning gives you the following rights. First, right to remain silent. A person under custodial investigation has a right to refuse answering any questions. Those who give up the right to remain silent face the prospect that their statements will be used against them in the court. However, keeping your mouth shut the whole time is not enough for them to realize that you wish to remain silent. You must expressly invoke them by saying something. Second, the right to competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice. If the person cannot afford services of a counsel, he must be provided one without charges. Third, the right to be informed of such rights. 
the officer is duty bound to explain the effects of these rights and ensure the person's understanding in a language understood by him. Next, waiving Miranda rights. This happens when a person refrains from using his Miranda rights. For example, a person decided to talk to the police officers even after he has been informed of his right or he will say, yes, I understand my rights, but I am willing to talk to you. Here are the requirements in waiving Miranda rights. First, it must be in writing. Second, it must be in the presence of a counsel. However, this is not advisable. It is better to talk to a lawyer for a full explanation of the law to avoid further damages. Next, the right to presumption of innocence. This means the accused will be innocent until proven guilty. Third, the right to a speedy, impartial public trial. Speedy means that as much as possible, the court shouldn't delay the trial because it would prolong the agony of the accused. Impartial means that whether the accused is the Pope or a homeless person, the judicial system must be fair. Last is a public trial, or a trial open to the public. The accused's friends, relatives, and others who are interested to observe the proceedings may attend the trial. Fourth, right against the use of torture, force, violence, threat, and intimidation. Police officers cannot slap, beat, threaten, or intimidate an accused in custody. It is against the Constitution to use any method that would hurt the accused. If they violate this right, they will be punished by the law. Number 5. Right against being held in secret detention, incommunicado, or similar forms of solitary detention. Secret detentions occur when detainees are held incommunicado or when they are not permitted to contact the outside world, including their families and lawyers, and when detaining authorities refuse to acknowledge either the fact of the detention or the fate and whereabouts of the detainee. The new constitution included this right to avoid what happened during the time of President Marcos. It is also important to learn the doctrine of poisonous tea. Any evidence that is illegally acquired cannot be used in court against the defendant. For example, Lorena was arrested for murder. And she was sent to a secret detention where she was forced to admit the charges against her. Her confession for the crime cannot be used in court even if she's guilty of the crime because the evidence was illegally acquired and it violated the rights of Lorena as an accused. Number 6. The right to be informed of the charges and causes of accusation. The accused person will be informed of the charges that he is charged with. After a defendant is arrested, booked, and a bail appearance is completed, the defendant will then be arraigned. The arraignment is a hearing in which the defendant is formally charged. The rights are read, the court will appoint an attorney if the defendant doesn't have one. Also, during the arraignment, the defendant can plead either guilty or not guilty of the crime that he is charged with. Next, the right to compulsory production of witnesses and evidence. The accused has the right to demand other people who have evidence that would be helpful to him to appear in court. The judge may issue the following. First, subpoena, a writ ordering a person to attend the court. Second, subpoena duces tecum, a writ ordering a person to attend the court and bring relevant documents. Number 8. Right against self-incrimination. You probably heard John Napolis on national TV said, I invoke my right against self-incrimination. Every celebrated witness in a Senate or House of Representatives investigative hearing, when faced with a difficult question to answer, would just respond, I invoke my right to self-incrimination. So what is self-incrimination? Self-incrimination in law is the giving of evidence that might tend to expose the witness to a punishment for the crime. Therefore, the right against self-incrimination forbids the government from compelling any person to give testimonial evidence 
that would likely incriminate him during a criminal case. It covers testimonial compulsion and compulsion to produce real or physical evidence using the body of the accused. Number 9. The right not to be detained by reasons of political beliefs and aspirations. This right guarantees the people to freely express their political beliefs and aspirations without fear of arrest or prosecution, which was denied during the time of President Marcos. Thousands of people who criticized the government, particularly the political opponents, were arrested. They were known as political prisoners. The new constitution made sure not to repeat the history so this right was included. Number 10. The right against involuntary servitude. Involuntary servitude refers to compulsory service or simply the modern-day slavery. The new constitution prohibits involuntary servitude. However, there are exceptions to the prohibition. First, as a punishment of the crime. Second, in the case of personal, military, or civil service in the defense of the state. Third, in compliance to return to work order issued by the Department of Labor and Employment. Fourth, Army or Naval Enlistment. Last, if it is exercised by parents on children. Number 11. The Right Against Excessive Fines A fine is the money imposed by the court as a punishment for the crime. A fine is excessive when it is unreasonable and beyond the limits prescribed by the law. For example, a fine of 10,000 pesos for theft of 50 pesos is clearly excessive. This is against the new constitution. Number 12. A right against cruel, degrading, and inhumane punishment. Cruel punishment is prohibited, like cutting of fingers or cutting the penis of a rapist. Number 13. The right to bail. Bail is a cash, bond, or property that an arrested person gives to a court to ensure that he or she will appear in court when ordered to do so. If the defendant doesn't show up, the court may keep the bail and issue a warrant for the defendant's arrest. Any person accused or detained has the right to invoke bail except when the crime committed is punishable by reclusion perpetual or the imprisonment of at least 20 years and one day to a maximum of 40 years and the evidence of guilt is strong. Next, the right against the infliction of death penalty. The 1987 Philippine Constitution abolished death penalty. It was reduced to reclusion perpetua, but with a reservation. The Congress can still pass a law imposing death penalty for heinous crimes, or crimes that are evil and wicked, like murder and rape. Last, the right against double jeopardy. Double jeopardy means that a person is twice put at the risk of conviction for the same act or offense. The right against double jeopardy therefore means that a person can only be charged once by the court. For example, when a person has been charged of murder and the court found him not guilty of the crime, he can no longer be prosecuted for the same act or offense. He can now invoke his right against double jeopardy. However, there are limitations. First, double jeopardy applies to criminal cases only. Second, it does not protect the defendant from multiple prosecutions for multiple offenses. For example, a person acquitted of murder could be tried again for different offenses. That's all for this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. If you have friends who are interested in this topic, please click the share button Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.